where as always, whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. We welcome you this morning, uh, both for worship and for our annual business meeting. Um, I have a couple of uh, announcements and uh, things to share this morning before we get started. Uh, as you can probably hear or not hear, um, our uh, audio system is due to be repaired uh, this coming week, and so we will have sound back next week. Our video system is down as well, I think as part of the uh, uh, equipment that has been removed that was faulty anyway. So we're doing a little old school today. Um, the second part of that is that I found out about 20 minutes ago that our daughter Anna tested positive for COVID this morning. So I'm going to remain masked and stay away from everyone. Um, and uh, um, I'm not symptomatic or anything like that, but uh, so in the back, if you can't hear me at times, just give me a wave and I will try to uh, uh, project even a little stronger. So lots of exciting stuff this morning. Uh, as I mentioned, our annual meeting will be after worship this morning, so please plan to, uh, to stay. We uh, only have a few items of business and we'll try to move through those. Um, as efficiently as we can. Roger, Brenda, do you want to say anything about the, uh, the survey? The Fertile Committee and Tech and Geeks, and we're putting out a survey to get everybody's thoughts on taking help with uh, the preparation mm -hmm. and sale of the Fertile. Well, I would like to survey and put it in the offering plate or some other directions on there. <coughs> Text John Jenkins with your, with your result. All right. So if you didn't get one, make sure to pick one up before you leave today. What other announcements need to be shared this morning? All right. Well, let's uh, take a moment then and prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning as we hear the playing of this morning's prelude.
I should have mentioned uh, at the outset as well, uh, in order to provide access to our worship and our meeting today um, and to help meet our quorum, we have uh, our Zoom call running. That's what the uh, uh, contraption here in the front is. And so uh, we have folks at home join us as well, as well and we want to welcome them uh, this morning as well. I invite those who are able to please stand and let us join together in our call to worship. Our God is the creator of heaven and earth. God created every blade of grass and towering tree. Our God is the architect and builder of all things. God formed the mountains and formed us all. Our God is the molder and shaper of things to come. God has plans for us, a future with love. Come, let us worship the author of life. Let us celebrate our Creator and rejoice in being God's creation. Amen. Our opening hymn is We Sing Your Mighty Power, O God. steadfast love fills the cosmos. It beckons us to take refuge and comforts us in rough times. So draw near. You are in the right place. This is the house of love. You are accepted no matter what. And in the name of Christ, we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.
So a few weeks ago in uh, the receiving line after, after worship, someone made the comment to me, and it's something that I hear on a fairly regular basis. It had to do with uh, a sense of frustration of wanting to do more, but feeling perhaps not powerful enough or not adequate enough or not able enough to affect change on a large scale. And so I was thinking this week about Legos. And I have a nice video to show that would have made this much clearer and much more visible, but stick with me here. So with Legos, I mean, you take an average Lego brick, it's pretty unassuming, right? Square, boxy, inflexible, not much you can do with it, right? Except, and Graham, you can start the video on your end if you want, um, except when you begin to put it together with other Lego blocks. And as you build with these blocks, and I don't have an hour or two to build a nice fancy contraption for you, but as those blocks work together and use each other's capabilities and each other's sizes and each other's shapes, you can come up with all sorts of interesting combinations. And you can build together much larger structures than this. And so what I invite you to do today, our scripture reading is going to feature a uh, familiar miracle that Jesus did. And certainly that's important to think about. But in the whole scope of things, think about the ways that other people, other than, you know, it's, it's Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding of Cana. None of us have that ability. Or if you do, please let me know. <laughs> but none of us have that ability. But pay attention to the story about who really makes that miracle happen. And I think it's a powerful lesson for all of us that even though we may not have that miraculous touch or ability that Jesus has, that we can all make miracles happen nonetheless. So pay attention for that when we get into um, our scripture and our sermon today. Let's have a, a word of prayer. God, we thank you for the gift and the power that we have in community together, praising you and following in your ways. Help us to remember that we are never as powerless as we sometimes feel because we have you and your Holy Spirit in our lives, leading us and guiding our ways. And for that, we are ever grateful. Amen.
God, how precious is your steadfast love. How glorious is your loving kindness that your Son, our Savior, should begin your marvelous work not with the display of power over nature that we might tremble or with a flashy revelation of his divinity that we might be smug or even with providing relief from pain or illness, that we might be reminded of the fragility of these earthen vessels. But instead, he began with another kind of provision. Water, necessary, humble, life-giving water, turned into wine, a sign of your abundance and your hospitality and your joy. It's not that we need it. It's not even that we desire it. It's that you desire it for us, that we should know your abundance, that we might dare to draw near to your table of hospitality, that unexpectedly we might taste the sweetness of your love and, deep, and drink deeply of it. And so today we share the goodness of your love with those who need it the most. And we lift our thoughts and prayers that dwell deep within our hearts to you, O Lord, in this moment of quiet meditation. For all of our 
prayers this morning. We ask your blessing and your mercy. And we ask this in all things. In the one who makes miraculous changes in our lives. Jesus the Christ. Who has taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As I mentioned a moment ago, our gospel reading this morning is... John's account of the miracle at the wedding of Cana, and we find it in the second chapter of John's Gospel, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you to do. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each of them holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. And when the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who drew, had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believe in him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning's text features probably one of the most well-known miracles of Jesus, turning water into wine. And there are so many interesting details going on in this story that when we step back to really listen to it, it probably raises a lot of questions for us. Whose wedding was it? Why didn't Jesus want to help out? Just how much of a mom look did Mary give him to make him perform that miracle? And the big one, at least for me, is what was the point of this miracle? Now, a lot of people have fun with this. I had a, a, uh, a funny uh, meme to show you. You've probably seen them on social media. Um, if not, you can look them up and find them very easily. A lot of people have fun with this story. After all, who among us wouldn't want to invite Jesus to our cocktail party uh, if we knew that he had these sorts of powers, right? So, and we can joke about it, but when we take it seriously, we do have to ask ourselves, what really is the point of this story? Why does John tell this story? And how does it serve to shape our faith and our actions to make them more in line with life in the kingdom of God? And so, as I was thinking about this passage this week, I started paying attention to Mary or as she's referred to in John's Gospel, simply as the mother of Jesus. And I paid attention to her prominent role in this story. 
And I started to notice her role in affecting this miracle, even though she didn't have the kind of divine power that Jesus did. Debbie Thomas helps articulate some of the things I was feeling as I studied this text when she writes, Mary's is an odd and provocative role, but I'm grateful for it because it allows me a place in what otherwise feels like an inaccessible narrative. I have no idea how to turn gallons of water into gallons of wine, but I do know how to say what Jesus' mother says. Sometimes, that's the only thing that I know how to say. There is need here. Everything is not okay. They have no wine. So maybe, instead of focusing all of our attention on Jesus in this passage, we might be better served to watch what Mary does. Thomas goes on to point out four actions of Mary that all of us can carry out on a daily basis in order to affect positive change in our workplaces, our homes, our communities, and beyond. So first off, Mary notices a problem. We see problems around us every day. Some are huge, seemingly impossible challenges, and others are just part of how we navigate life on a regular basis. In the case of our story, Mary notices that the wedding party is about to run out of wine. Now it's important to know that in the ancient world, wedding feasts lasted for days. And it was the host's sacred responsibility to provide abundant food and drink for the duration of the festivities. And so to run out of wine early was a dishonor and a disgrace, a breach of hospitality that the guests would likely remember for years to come. Now, we don't know what Mary's relationship was with the bride and the groom or their families, but we do know that in the midst of the celebration, she notices that there is a need. She identifies a problem. She understands the probability of embarrassment and dishonor that could arise from this situation. And if John's account is accurate, she notices all of this before Jesus does. I think back to the national youth event that I took some of our youth to uh, now a number of years ago. And one of the speakers at that event was M.K. Asante, and he told the audience that if you make an observation, you have an obligation. And the implication of that is that if all of us followed through on things that we observed that were broken or that were not working in the world, we could really make a difference. And I see this truth affirmed in this account of Mary's observation of the problem and the work that she does to rectify it. Next, Mary tells the right person. Now, not all of us have a promised Messiah as an immediate family member, but we likely know who to go to when we have a problem. In the same way, Mary recognizes the problem, and she knows who can help her to make it right. In her case, she's certain that Jesus can not only fix the problem, but that his generosity is extravagant enough that she knows that he will do it. I think one of the most interesting parts of the story is when Jesus initially refuses to help. And there's any number of reasons why he dismisses Mary. He's at a great party with his friends. He doesn't want to be bothered. Or he has yet to reveal his true identity. And he knows that things in his life will change very quickly once he performs a public miracle. And maybe he wants that first miracle to be something other than making more wine. Maybe he and God had a slightly different timeline worked out 
And Mary's request doesn't quite pair with that. We'll never know the reason. But Jesus certainly doesn't seem very interested at the moment. But nevertheless, Mary persisted. Whatever Jesus' reasons might have been, they weren't good enough for Mary to rescind her request. She continues to press the urgency of the situation. According to John, she turns to the servants and tells them to do what Jesus asks. I suspect that John failed to include in his narrative the massive mom guilt trip face that Mary shot to Jesus before dispatching the servants. She persists in her request until Jesus agrees to participate. It was as if she said to Jesus, I don't care about your plans for your coming out party. There's a desperate problem here right now. Change your plans, have some empathy, and help out. Does that sound, sound reasonable? Yeah. So finally, Mary instills trust, and she invites obedience. Do whatever he tells you, she advises the household servants. She doesn't need to know the specifics of how Jesus was going to take care of this, but she does know that she found the right person to remedy the situation. She transmits this faith and this trust in Jesus to the servants who will help. As Thomas writes, if I'm reading the story correctly, the servant's task isn't easy. There's no running water in the ancient world, and those stone jars are huge. How many trips to the well? How much arm strength? How much resolve that task requires? I imagine it's Mary's faith that helps the servants persevere when they feel bewildered and ridiculous. She acts as a catalyst, turning potential into action. She lays the groundwork for Jesus' instructions. Fill the jars. Draw some out. Take it to the chief steward. She fosters a faith-filled atmosphere that becomes contagious. She instills wonder in those around her, and she ushers in a miracle. So let's review. Mary notices a problem. She takes the problem to the right person. She persists when she's met with resistance. And she instills faith and trust in the plan to solve the problem. We may not often find ourselves at wedding receptions that run out of wine. But we do see problems in our own society all the time. And we may not have the power to work those miracles ourselves. We may not have the authority or the resources to solve all of the problems that we identify. But we do have the ability to make a difference in our community and in our world. We celebrate that idea today as we gather for our annual business meeting as a congregation. And we'll worry about numbers in our financial reports. And we'll talk about changes to projects due to COVID and other factors that we can't control. And in the process, we might even wonder if there's any point in even worrying about all these things. After all, what we do here sometimes might just seem insignificant. And when we think that way, we would do well to remember this passage and to be reminded by this story that maybe we, too, are capable of working miracles. It might not be as flashy as those of Jesus, but if we can identify a problem and work to assure its correction, we might just make a miraculous difference in someone's life and in turn make this world a little better of a place to live. And that, my friends, is something to drink to. Thanks be to God. Amen. I didn't get to do this at the proper time with the prayers, but I, I would like to ask for extra prayers for Barb. 
she's having a pretty sensitive uh, procedure done tomorrow. Oh. And we do need to have prayers. Okay. Well, Barb, we will certainly keep you in our prayers tomorrow and in the coming days. Uh, thank you. Thank you for including that. Small, seemingly insignificant actions can lead to miraculous outcomes. That's what our scripture lesson today teaches us. And we've seen the truth of that statement at various times in all of our lives. And so today we celebrate our small, seemingly insignificant gifts of time and talent and treasure to the life and ministry of this congregation. We may not always feel that we are making a difference, but we know that by combining our efforts and relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, our gifts can indeed make a difference in the world for the better. And so in order to celebrate these miraculous gifts, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we share together in our prayer of dedication. At the wedding feast at Cana, you gladdened the guests with divine generosity, filled to the brim and flowing over. We offer our gifts with grateful hearts. Bless them and our lives to your service, that they may reveal your glory, nurture faith, and manifest the common good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
following our benediction. Friends, drink deeply of God's love, for God's love endures forever. Drink deeply of God's spirit, for God's spirit endures forever. And feast on the abundance of God's gifts, for those gifts ever end. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may have a seat, and we'll begin here in just a moment.